Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Scuttlebutt Podcast. I'm Rich Mellon. This evening, I have a guest from the west of me over in uh, British Columbia, a uh, longtime uh, trapper, very, very successful trapper, uh, a fellow who has written a book. We're going to talk about this new book that he that he has out. Please welcome Paul, Paul Blackwell. How are you this evening, Paul? Uh, very good. Busy time of the year, starting to get going. <laughs> How, how's the weather there? Uh, the weather has been very windy, um, but uh, incredibly warm. We've had very little frost here in central BC um, and uh, and no snow at all yet. So uh, certainly when, there's some climate change effects. When you say central BC, where, whereabouts? Um, uh, <clears throat> south of Williams Lake and, uh, and um, north of Hundred Mile House. Okay. I live on, uh, I'm very lucky, I live on a, a little lake um, that is well stocked with fish and uh, most people think my trapper's cabin is rather extravagant. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you, that's a very beautiful spot of the world over there. I, I, I know where you're talking about well. I, uh, it is. We've, we've spent plenty of time in BC. So you... Uh, have a whole backstory that we've got to, we will have to get into. I mean, uh, you uh, you come here from from England and you've had led a fascinating life. But first, let's talk about your book. What is your book called? The Mad Trapper from Greeny Lake, which is the little lake that I that I live on. Okay. And I should explain the title. I because a lot of people are quite confused. Uh, I. Um, um, my wife thinks I'm insane from time to time, but the the, the Mad Trapper came about when um, uh, the log and truck drivers, one of the log and truck drivers that uh, had just missed me, said, "How are you doing today, Mad Trapper?" I, and um, uh, I said, "Well, I'm doing fine, but I'm pretty mad at you guys for cutting down all the trees and uh, and trying to put me out of business." So that sort of stuck and and. Um, and when uh, my first editor took a look at the manuscript, he thought that was a great title. So we, we stuck with it. Oh, cool, cool. So we'll come back to this again at the end, but where can people find your book? Um, <clears throat> we're actually, it, it's available in a few local bookstores, but we're actually selling most of the books now by mail order. Um, People are e-transferring to pblackwell63 at hotmail.com. Okay. And um, what I'm doing is giving members of, of trappers associations across the country a special deal. I'm, I'm giving them, I'm sending the book out uh, postpaid for $24, which is uh, quite a savings. Wow. That, is, that is quite the deal. I know I, I, got, I got to get a couple of them from you. I've got, we were just down in, um, in Texas hunting uh, Audad, but I have a friend in uh, uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico, and he comes from Alaska. And of course, he's uh, been on Las Cruces now for quite a while. New Mexico is very, very different from Alaska, and he misses the trapping and that. And I, I told him that, uh, about how we kind of missed on our first try at this podcast and, and about this book he wrote. And he says, well, man, he says, that would be a, a good book to read. So, uh, He's a good buddy. He, said, he sends me pistachios that they grow in New Mexico, so I'm going to send him one of your books. <laughs> okay, we, we can certainly arrange that. Yeah, definitely. We'll take care of all of that later. Well, let's, let's talk about you then. Uh, of course, you wrote a book about trapping, so you, you have some bona fides. Let, let's start. Uh, you were actually born in England, right? Yeah, I was born in the southwest of England, and um, I came over... <laughs> on one of the last Canadian steamships um, in 1967 to see Expo 67. Wow. Um, and quite by accident, I, well, I was supposed to end up in Edmonton, uh, a great aunt Ida's place, but the person I met on the boat said, oh, you'd hate it in Edmonton in the winter, so you should come out of the West Coast. Well, when I got out to the West Coast, I fell in love with British Columbia and, and coastal and well, and all of British Columbia. And, uh, and I've been here ever since. And actually I took out citizenship pretty much the day I was el eligible so that, uh, so they couldn't think of sending me back. 
Well, so how old were, were you when, when you came over? Uh, 19. Okay. Tell me a little bit about England. Like, I mean, living there and, and growing up, uh, uh, somewhere along the line, you got bit by the trapping bug. W we, did you trap there? <laughs> yeah, when, uh, not very much. I, I was actually born on a farm in, in the southwest of England, uh, very close to the, the Atlantic, uh, well, the British Channel coast. And um, my dad uh, took me out and showed me how to, catch moles in their in their runways and, and we use ferrets to drive uh, rabbits into into nets so I was a bit of a country boy then when I was 11 uh, my parents decided I was getting too unruly so they sent me to a boarding school well at the boarding school they had a problem with uh, <clears throat> moles digging up the ruining the the cricket pitches and I said well I can solve that so I, I started never catching do moles. Pitch. <laughs> well, I, and, and I got paid six cents a mole or sixpence a mole, and that was that was really great pocket money in those days. But oh. while I was there, um, to to avoid the boredom of studies, studying, I uh, I read a lot, and I read a book by Eric Collier called Three Against the Wilderness, oh. and I. I was enthralled by it and I, I read it three or four times and I decided I had to had to, to come to British Columbia at some point and try and check that out. Uh, and I, and you know when I when I got to, to Vancouver and, and worked there for a while, I kept thinking, oh you know, I one of these days I gotta do that. And then I started hunting and fishing a lot and ended up in the caribou quite a bit. Um, that's, that's, that's how it happened. And I, uh, I ended up uh, going to, to university in Vancouver in Burnaby and getting a teaching certificate. And I, um, I taught high school for a few years, but I always wanted to try the trap line. So, uh, I, I want, I want, I want to home. ask you a question. Oh, I, you, you talked yeah. about chasing rabbits with ferrets. That sounds to me yep. like unholy glee for, for a little boy. Uh, I, I, I wish we, we had such a thing when I was a kid. Are they trained? Are the ferrets trained? Like, I mean, how, how do you do this? Well, you, you, you find a, a network of burrows and, and, uh, and you put um, purse nets over each of the holes, except the one, well, even the one you put the ferret down. The ferret goes down, and of course the, the 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 rabbits are terrified of the ferret, so they come flying out of the holes into these purse nets, and then you grab a hold of them and uh, and uh -huh. dispatch them. Um, the problem is because the ferrets are are basically like our our fishers, really. They're well bigger than a I mink. Mean. Well, like it, you have black-tailed ferrets on the on the prairies still, I think. But anyway, sometimes the ferret would um, kill a rabbit in a in a blind hole uh, or a blind burrow, and that was a problem. We either had to wait for the ferret to come out or dig it out. Um, oh. So it didn't always work perfectly. But it, when it when it worked well, and those rabbits came shooting out into the purse nets, it was pretty exciting. Oh, that does sound that, that sounds excellent, like a lot of fun. I get I got grandchildren. I wish I could do that with. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When you talk about the caribou, you're talking about that area around Hundred Mile House. Uh, that 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 area is is called caribou country, right? Yeah. Um, I I I trapped nuisance. I did some nuisance trapping when I was on the coast, mm -hmm. and um. So I did some research and I, I found out um, when I joined the BC Trappers Association that the best trapping in BC um, in general is the Caribou Plateau. And the Caribou Plateau starts just north of Clinton and extends all the way up uh, uh, to Mackenzie, north of Prince George. And, and this, Boreal Forest Plateau um, has some of the best trapping in British Columbia for, for the most uh, variety of animals. 
Um, and that's why I, I picked, uh, well, I, I knew some people at Big Bar, which, which got me into it. Um, and then I kept looking for a, a bigger and bigger trap line until I uh, was able to buy the one I'm on now, which I, I've been on for, for 27 years. And it, uh, it covers 300 square, well, 290 square miles. Oh, it's, wow. a, it's a good wow. size. Yeah, it's a good size trap line. It has lots of water, several large lakes, and and some mountains in between. So, and of course, BBC, uh, every every puddle of water's got fish in it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm envious of that. I have lots of water on my line, but uh, I had to um, drain a beaver dam on the weekend. It was um, our waters are low, and you know, when you when a beaver builds a dam in sand, you know how how that that dam leaks all winter long. That sand dam won't won't, won't hold water, so it was already really low. And overnight, it went down like three inches. And and but the ice was starting to get pretty thick, two and a half three inches of ice. And so what would happen was 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 that eventually it would it would drop out from underneath that ice, and I'd be driving across it at some point during the winter and it'd give out. So it was just better to to let the dam out. It's not a live dam. There's no there's no beaver in it. But while I was pulling, I, you know, busted the ice and, and chopped out the dam and, and started the water moving. That I had a couple of pike that big, like just little little pike, fully mature. That's as big as they ever get in that little creek or whatever. But they were already dead. You know, this, and this was on uh, on Saturday, so you know, the thirtieth of, of, of October. Uh, they were already dead from lack of oxygen. You know, it, it, it was, but just the way it, it works, right? Uh, fascinating. You wouldn't wouldn't think that that little creek held any fish whatsoever. Yet, perfectly mature. They're, they're, they're very very neat looking fish, but they're already dead. So, I I, I got the water let out, and, and uh, the ice had all collapsed by the time I left. So I, I don't have to worry about it later in the winter. <laughs> I don't need that kind of excitement in my life anymore. <laughs> so so you have freeze up now? Just started. We literally were Just floating started. across the, the dams on Thursday, and then it went down to minus 16. And, uh, you know, that, that, that put an inch, uh, inch or inch and a half on, on the, the beaver dams. And then, you know, two more nights of about 14, 15, that kind of stuff. And uh, right. yeah, we're, we'll probably, I'll probably be able to drive on, I'll be going out, uh, what's today? Tuesday. I'm going out tomorrow. I'll probably be able to drive the Argo on, on the ice at that point. It's just we, we haven't been getting up in temperature whatsoever. We've got zero snow, which well, it's been a long time since I've had a first of November that had zero snow. Uh, I, I just got a message on the screen. Yeah. Yeah. I just got a message on the screen that my internet connection is unstable. Yeah, it's okay. I don't know whether you can hear that. I'm I'm seeing you perfect. So we're we're, we're doing okay. <laughs> okay. Good. <laughs> as long as I, I can see and hear you, it's recording on this end. We're good. No, it it uh, has been a very dry, warm year. We, uh, you know, we went from yeah. flooding for the last three years, where we had just so much water, we were just floating. You know, it was uh, yeah. it, it made for difficult trapping, and and uh, you know, you never. Do you get uh, weeping muskeg there, where the the, the water? The water flows across the through the muskeg all winter, and it keeps freezing in layers and layers and layers of ice. Pretty soon, where it goes across your trail, you might have three, four feet of ice. You don't. You don't uh, no, that. we don't get that. Oh, okay. we, 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 our biggest problem is, uh, you know, because the lakes are are fairly stable. Um, once we get a heavy snowfall, then we get what we call overflow, where where the snow pushes the water up through the ice. And, and and when I teach, I, I teach my students that is one of the most dangerous things, uh, especially when you're on a snowmobile, because it's if you break through that crust into that overflow, uh, the the track clogs up and you're 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 stuck. Yeah, you need horsepower then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's one of the most fascinating things though about our, about our ecosystem that so many people don't understand when when we're dealing with things like muskeg is, is how much water actually filters through them. And the, the best uh, definition of this is, is in the wintertime where, the, where these flow. And I've got, I don't know how many mm -hmm. spots. Like my, my, whole, my whole line is very wet. And the, the, there's a lot of muskeg, but I got a lot of spots where 
all summer long, you, you couldn't hardly get tires wet on a, on a machine. And then all of a sudden you'll have ice build up, several feet ice build up, and then a hole will pop through. And you can shove a, a, a shovel down in there, sometimes 18 inches, two feet. And there's current. You can watch current and everything flowing through this musket. Well, we, we have nothing like that oh. uh, in, in central BC. Northern BC, I, I think, is, is very similar to that. And, and I did trap one, one part of one winter up in, up in the north on, on a muskeg type trap line. But, yeah. but here, um, because it's very hilly and mountainous and, and the, la the lakes are uh, far more stable, um, but at the same time, with the springs, uh, they can be pretty dangerous. And, and uh, we used to be, like you, we used to almost be guaranteed freeze up the first week in November. Now, uh, it can be the second or third week the, the, the last few years. I think but it, it, it's certainly, yeah. certainly it's slightly different. I've watched your trapping and I've watched you working on the Argo and I've, I've been sort of pretty envious of that. <laughs> um, but I, I use a Honda side-by-side -side a lot now because the snow, snow doesn't come early enough. So. And yet it stays later. Pardon? And yet it stays later. You know, we have, yeah. we have, we have. That's now, right. It does. We yeah, it does. It stays later. Lots yeah. of Mays where we got lots of snow still, you know, in May. Yeah. You know, it just, it, yeah. it's, it, we, and we get big snowstorms in April and sometimes early May. It, it's just, just like it's shifted a little bit. Like the, the, the earth is, is, is out of wobble or something and, and it just slid our, our seasons a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's what saved us this year was that there was, there was that heavy snowpack pushed our lakes back up to almost record high levels so that when we got the heat dome and the, you know, the 38 degree weather, the lakes went down, but they didn't go down to the point where everything died. Um, yeah. And that's, that's what I was worried about. I thought there was going to be an incredible amount of summer kill, but, uh, but that, uh, those lakes stayed just high enough that uh, we were fine. Yeah, it was, it was In fast. In fact, we, we have a pretty good, I picked up 42 muskrats last week. Yeah. Uh, just for the, so I'd have enough for classes. And, um, and, and the muskrats were, are up this year. They, they're doing fairly well. Oh, good. Good. Hey, folks, Rich from Trapping Inc. TV here. And it's no secret that I'm a big fan of coffee. Our friends at Old Smokes, Smoke roast their coffee beans over wood fires. You have no idea how good coffee can taste until it's smoked coffee. Did you know that studies have shown that just the smell of fresh coffee can boost brain activity? Yeah, it's that good. Sandy and I have teamed up with Old Smoke's Coffee to make our own Trapping Ink coffee blend. Let me introduce you to Wolverine, an ultra dark roast coffee bean smoked over maple wood fires. This is the pure, uncut trapper's fuel that keeps us laughing and trapping all day long. If you'd like to try our special blend, you can find it at www.trappinginc.com forward slash shop. If dark roast isn't your thing, Old Smokes has five different coffee roasts from light to extra dark, each roasted over a different wood for a unique flavor. Right now, you can order from their online store and use our promo code RICH, that's R-I-C-H, and get 10% off your entire order. Just go to www.oldsmokescoffee.com. That's O-L-E, smokescoffee.com, and use the promo code RICH. That is promo code RICH for 10% off your entire order. And now let's get back to today's show. Yeah, I just, I just got done with my muskrat last, last Wednesday, I guess I, I got done. And um, uh, I didn't get as many as I usually do. It um, mm -hmm. could be that it just year after year after uh, of trapping, but I don't think it's that. I think it's the the lower water and and there's less um, escape area for them. There's less habitat for them. Right. Like where I yeah. trapped in the springtime, I would trap between all, all of our ponds here have have a big rim of cattails, right? All the way around mm -hmm. the pond, there's this big rim of cattails, and it's ten to to thirty feet deep or whatever. And then in the springtime, from those cattails to shore. I mean, it, 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 there'll be a lot of water there. There's enough water there to, to trap, you know, like, 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 and we spent all, all this spring trapping between the, the cattails and shore. Well, now I 
I, I drive my Argo right over to the cattails and, and, and out across the cattails. You know, like the, the water has gone down. So um, I don't know whether there's a habitat pinch going on or, or, you know, lots of times we are so guilty of just overthinking things that it could just be a, a cycle for, for the muskrats too. Right? A cycle, yeah. 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 You know, yeah, like could... there was there was so many people that were going on and on about the Martin recently and about how, uh, you know, the Martin are, are you know, the numbers are down and that we maybe need to cut back or put a quota on Martin and that. And then there was people like me and, 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 um, fellow, he was the president of our, of our, uh, trappers local and I, you know, we had just a giant year in the middle of when everybody says there was no Martin left. He had like 82 or 87 Martin on, on, on a line practically in, in, in farmland. And I, I had, I think I hit 50 or 55 on, on my line. Well, that, that's much higher than they, they, they'd ever been before. So you never know what is the effect, right? You know, when you start. Yeah, the Martin here, the Martin here definitely follow the white-footed deer mice cycles. And that's about a three-year cycle. So then we, we get a little. White-footed deer mice. Okay. White-footed deer mice are the predominant food of Martin here um, in, on the caribou, in the caribou plateau. And, uh, and they run on about a three-year cycle. And, and of course, the cone crops for the squirrels make quite a difference as well. So um, we should have a, a medium crop of, of, of Martin this year, but... Uh, White-footed uh, deer mouse, is that, is that like a long-tailed, like I think we as kids call them kangaroos. Yeah? It's a, yeah? Really, a really common mouse. Okay. Um, white feet. Oh. And um, for us here, it's the red back vole. Which, yeah. Well, in the alpine areas, you're right. In the in the Al alpine areas of British Columbia, uh, in the in the on the more mountainous trap lines, the red back vole is is the chief food there. But once you get down on the plateau, though, it, it's the white footed deer mouse. Okay, well, we're we're in Prairie Park, the flat country. <laughs> we have both the white-footed deer mouse and we have the red-backed bull, but we have way more yeah. red-backed bull. And okay, you know, well, you're and, lucky because you'll have more mitten, Martin. Yeah. Um, did you know though that we have um, they just red-listed Fisher here? Really? Yeah, we they the biologists have decided that we have a subspecies of. Fisher in the caribou, and it's a species at risk. So they have um, they stopped us trapping them. Uh, they closed the season, and they're they've given us some of these Martin boxes with the exclusion plates. Um, so there's a hole that a Martin can get through, but a Fisher can't. Yeah, a two and a quarter inch hole. And I. Well, I tested some last winter uh, with trail cams on them with a biologist. And um, they were, quite frankly, a real pain. Um, to well, they stopped the Martin to too? 50. Yeah, the Martin, Martin went in them. I mean, I did catch a couple of really big male Martin that, that got through the hole and, and were caught inside, but... Um, Trappers don't really like them because there's no way to to have that martin hanging free so that uh, there's no fur damage or or heat damage. So, yep, exactly. We're fighting it, but I got a feeling they uh, they are they're gonna try and push that down our throats in the next uh, regulation cycle. So we'll we'll see. I what always fear these these unknown subspecies. You know, they did the same thing with the Algonquin wolf in Ontario, right? And all it is, is it's, it's a hybrid between the uh, Eastern wolf and, and the, the Eastern coyote. And yeah. uh, it's been called the red wolf and it's been called the Algonquin wolf and all that. And, and they forbid trapping it. And it's, it's strictly a hybrid that's been produced since man's been involved because uh, how, how it helped the uh, increase the population of coyotes. And I've read a lot of uh, a lot of uh, articles and studies and that on it, and, and it's the stupidest science ever. Like, I mean, honest to God, it, it, it'd be no different than if you had 
German Shepherds breeding with, with, with Cayutes and we should protect them because they're a unique species. I also read an article, another guy says, if you think that's stupid, look at this. And he sends me an article and it is from a biologist in Ontario. And because of, of climate change or, or the, the uh, expansion of their territory or whatever, possums have shown up in Southern Ontario. They want to protect them. They want to protect <laughs> possums. <laughs> <laughs> What's next, mosquitoes I, I, and black flies? <laughs> I, I should tell you the, the you know, I, I when I when I was uh, teaching school, um, I was trapping in the Fraser Valley, and I caught a possum one day um, in a in a foot trap. We were using little number two foot traps there for um, for mink at that point, and, and I caught a possum, and I was looking at this thing. And uh, all of a sudden, the hair seemed to move. <laughs> so I looked really closely, and it was covered in little red mites. And the <laughs> <laughs> needless to say, that that didn't go home to get skinned or anything. It, uh, oh. it was um, <laughs> there, if 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 the bait is absolutely disgusting, then then you catch a possum every night. Really, I don't know anything about it. I've never, I've never even seen one in real life. I, I know that you know you, you always see pictures on the internet. The internet is so great for that. I just seen a picture of, of Pete Wise. You must know Pete well. Oh no, yeah, yeah. We yeah, see a yeah. picture of this squirrel standing on his on, on his uh, shoulder and it's nibbling on his on his cheek and all that. Around here, squirrels are just about even if they're dead, they're still moving from fleas. I can't imagine having ever allowed a squirrel on my shoulder. And there's a picture of beating the squirrel on his shoulder. It's like, oh. <laughs> oh, that kind of thing doesn't bother Pete. <laughs> when, you're, when you're dealing with several thousand starlings and skunks and rattlesnakes, uh, you know, a few fleas is, is yeah. part of the job. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, let's get back to your story. So you went to the university and you got a degree in English? Yes, I did, yeah. And and that, uh, that got you a teaching job? And that got me a teaching job, yeah. I, I, I actually uh, got a, uh, a degree in English with a secondary teaching certificate so I could teach high school, yeah. Oh, high school, oh and, joy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and the funny part about that is I, telling the book is that after after five years of teaching grade eights, I figured I'd end up uh, killing one of them or <laughs> becoming an overweight alcoholic. So I decided it was time to head for the trap line. <laughs> <laughs> Amen to that. I, I, I couldn't stand me when I was in grade eight. <laughs> I can't imagine teaching them year after year after year. You're a special kind yeah. of student. <laughs> So, so I, um, you know, I, I of course I, I fell in love with the the caribou and 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 the trapping community and and uh, became an instructor and started writing for the the trapper magazine, and um, I still had lots of relatives in England, so um, uh, a year and a half or so ago, I decided. Uh, I'm not getting any younger, and I should put together a lot of my stories so it would explain to them why I spent 40 years. I gave up a perfectly good job and spent 40 years uh, in the bush uh, trapping. And so I, I wrote this book originally for that purpose, but I, I took the manuscript um, to uh, the editor of uh, retired editor editor of the local hundred mile paper, and he said, uh, "You know, what do you think of this?" And he read it and he said, "You know, you should publish this because it it explains a lot more than just a trapper going out and killing animals. It explains why you fight the forest companies over habitat and how you manage the trap line for the different animals and stuff." So I, I worked on it a little bit more, and then I got uh, a local publisher involved. And um, she was really, really great. 
but by the end of um, uh, the fifth draft, <laughs> I was ready to call the whole thing quits. Um, but after the sixth draft, we went to print um, and, and actually published the book. And I, I still wasn't sure whether I'd done the right thing. But my sister in the South of England um, wanted several copies. And just about three weeks ago, she sent me a review um, written by a professor of agriculture at a university in Devon. And he wrote this review that basically said, I didn't really know much about trappers or trapping. And now I have a total, totally new perspective on trapping and how trappers are conservationists, how they, their main interest is looking after the land. And uh, that made the whole thing worthwhile. I thought, wow, that's, that's really great. And sure, um, you know, the, the general public that, that reads the book, like the skunk stories and the cougar stories and the bear stories and, you know, how close I came to, <laughs> to, 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 you know, getting mauled or, or, or that once, you know, those kind of things. But, um, Good. But overall, the book, uh, in my mind now, has been a, a, a success for that for that very reason that I've, I've converted a few people that really didn't know anything about the fur trade. You know what, though? I, I think that there's a whole bunch of people out there just like that gentleman. Because I know from our show that eight over 80% of our people our, our, our people, I, call, I always call them our people, our, our fans, the people who watch our show, um, aren't trappers. They have no connection to trapping, but they're fascinated with the life and they, they enjoy learning about it. We get a lot of feedback from um, text messages and, and emails and PMs on Facebook and all that kind of stuff. People say, you know, go to tell the whole story. Don't know nothing about trapping, didn't know anything about it, but I watched your show. And now I understand it. And I, I, I watched it and and I, I can understand, you know, that you're, you're using humane uh, techniques, that this is very different than what I believe. You've changed my, my mind on, on trapping. And to me, that's a big check mark in the wind there, man. <laughs> you know? It, it absolutely is. But you, you have to agree that your show um, is one of the first that has shown the true uh techniques of modern trapping and some of the reality shows um are are, are out to lunch still right well and i mean uh, it's <laughs> some of them are filmed where where they don't they're not controlled by the laws we are and i mean that was we went into this yeah. we wanted to just tell the truth we wanted to tell the truth and show yeah. how it was and and surprisingly our biggest critics are other trappers in other locales and they talk about how we knuckled under by, you know, using the certified traps and the and the body grip traps and, and the fact that, you know, uh, if I have Martin hanging out there and I, I, I have to replace the trap and everything because it, the Martin's frozen in there and, and they, you know, they, they say, well, that's so much more work and so much more expense and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, yeah, but you know what? We uh, reopened that European fur market. We let them set the standards for what was going to be yeah. the, the, the humane standard. And then we met it. You know, and I, I know, yeah, I just right. know that when we said to them, okay, well, you tell us what the standard is. And they sat there and, and had a good laugh for days before they wrote it up. They'll never, never be able to meet this. And then we, we meet, met it, you know. And because we were, in, in today's world, the word progressive is not, not a nice thing like it used to be. <laughs> But because we were progressive and, and, and changed with the times and, and adjusted to, to, to accept these humane standards, um, we stand apart from, from the old style uh, trapper and, and uh, we are much more palatable. You know, it, it's much well, more. And we still have a market, which, yeah. which was in doubt. Um, you know, when I sat on the Wild Fur Shippers Council, I met with trappers from all both sides of the border and that in and at, at one point 
um, our one of our ministers was going to actually ban trapping in British Columbia, and we managed to convince him not to. But um, but you're absolutely right. Um, without those standards, we we wouldn't be trapping today. No, I don't. I don't um, think so. I I don't. And do you know what though? My animals are dead when they get there, and I'm okay with that. You know, I I don't want. I, I, I don't want them to be waiting for me to show up to to, to finish the job. You know, I, I I'm I'm perfectly happy with, with with, and maybe that's just you know I'm damn it though I'm 62 years old and and I I learned trapping when I was a little savage and mm -hmm. we caught and killed most about anything with a one and a half or 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 a number two trap and my my goodness right. if somebody had a three or four that was a monster we'd go after bear with that you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't, but you know, you know what I'm saying. That was a monster. There was so many people today talk about what, well, what's the number two good for? Well, just you know, nothing bigger than a fox. Well, we caught everything with the number two. That was, those were those were the laws back then. Whatever you could you could catch and hold, right? And then to see it change, and, and uh, actually, I don't know. Maybe I was just I was at that point in my life. You know, as we get older, you know, we you know. Uh, the different stages and that, that 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 people and hunters and trappers or whatever go through i was just ready for 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 that and uh having i guess having that legal justification or whatever i was okay with it i, I was prepared for for the uh, body good pass well i was too and and i worked with uh fic in vagerville on testing some of those early trap uh early uh modified magnum traps and you know, I didn't like the, the the first ones because they were too powerful and too dangerous. And I tried to sell them. Well, Indian and Northern Affairs uh, hired me to go around to some of the bands, and they were they were terrified of those traps. But the the traps we have now, the ones you use and I use, the LDLs and the and the Savageos and um and the Baliles. Yeah. Um, are wonderful in that they they make us money because there is little or no fur damage. Yeah. And you know the animal that goes in there is is killed instantly. And and that's a good feeling, but but you also know you're going to get the maximum amount of money out of that that pelt too, which is, is Well, and I mean and to good. further what exactly what you're saying, Paul, um uh, I all my all my Martin and Fisher sets are all 120s and 160 Belisles, and yeah, I catch I don't know for the last two years I think I'm over 150 short tail weasel in those same sets. I don't target the short tail weasel, but they're there all the time. Right? I even, I, even yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, you you know exactly what I'm talking about. Have you ever had a, a skunk climb a tree to get into one though? Uh, no, no. I had but two I, skunk I climb a tree last year. <laughs> Get into I did take 50, 50, 56, I think, short tail weasels last year. So yeah. uh, I know where you're coming from on the weasels. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But have you ever had one ruined by the trap? Hey, folks, Rich here with some exciting news from trappinginc.com. We were listening when you said you wanted more clothing, and we heard you loud and clear. We've expanded our clothing line more colors, men's, ladies, and children's sizes, more variety. Living off grid gives more time for the creative juices to flow. New humorous observations are added weekly, as well as our classic Trapping Inc. logo. We have joined forces with Tee Public. You can find our Tee Public storefront from the store page on trappinginc.com. Just go to www.trappinginc.com forward slash shop and just scroll down to find the link for our Trapping Inc. storefront. Or you can go to teepublic.com and enter Trapping Inc. TV in the search bar at the top. Check it out. Big sales every month, and you can save up to 35%. Don't miss out. Get your favorite gear today. And now let's get back to today's show. Sorry? Have you ever had one ruined by your trap? Uh, no, just a couple of tails that were yeah. almost chopped off. Yeah. That exactly it. And, and so that is, yeah. that is quite the, the uh, uh, you know, the design that goes into that, 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 that allows something that small. Well, well well, yeah. killing that Fisher or that Martin, and then, then to, to kill something that's that, that that's that big and and not actually chop it in half or whatever, that's yeah. a, that, that's a pretty fascinating design. It, I 
I maybe out of, out of the last hundred and some short tails, I might have had one or two that that actually had a hole in them or damage from the the trap, right? And those are one yeah, twenties and one right. you know. Yeah, big, um, well, I'm, I'm about the same. I yeah. use mostly LDLs because they're kind of they were more available here and and that, but it's, I've had the same effects. So I use a lot of pan triggers on them, but yeah, um, I I use pan triggers. Um, I'll use a little bit on Martin, uh, you know, on a, uh, a leaning full set. I'll put a pan, mm -hmm. I'll put, use a pan trigger, but I use pan triggers a lot uh, for a mink box where I'll have- uh, Absolutely, absolutely, of, yeah. uh, of muskrat guts yeah. in the back of a, of a box and I, I throw, I usually yeah. uh, throw a 160 or sometimes a 220 if it happens to be one of the creeks that the otters travel because 220 is legal for mm -hmm. otter. But I've never yet yeah. have an otter that ever went to bait. Never yet. No. no. Um, I I have a friend uh, on Vancouver Island um, who catches more otter than anybody I know. And he actually uses otter scent glands. I can believe um, that. And gets, and gets them to go into boxes. But uh, most of the otters we catch here are, are on very similar sets to the ones you use because I've, I've watched your your techniques on, yeah. on the shows yeah i'm only allowed a dozen of them a year and, and i mean it's like four days of heaven to get my dozen kind of thing you know because because they are so much fun they, they to, to target and, and to yeah. understand you know yeah. i find it fascinating i have a, a first nations friend who uses those otter glands in his link store oh really yes oh yeah it's it's not a real nice smell, so. Nope. <laughs> I, I don't know what your otters smell like there. Mine smell like a Weasley pike. <laughs> Mostly because they, yeah, eat, okay. they eat pike and they, and, and they eat um, uh, stickleback minnows. Like, right. I, I don't know if you've ever seen, I've had, I've had footage of them. The, there were two, three heads sticking out of a, an opening in the, in the creek like this big. And they're just floating there. Well, the top of that is 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 about two inches thick with with minnows, because they're all trying to get oxygen, right? Low oxygen, and they are sitting there. You watch them; they throw out their head, they're chewing, and I mean, they literally are like like cows eating grass. They just dip their head down, and they got another mouthful. And my my otters are so fat; it's it's beyond belief. And uh, when I skin them, like my the, the skin, you know, a lot of the fat pulls off off the carcass on on the skin, and and so I'll have a you know, a 30, uh, 30 pound otter there, I'll have a, a six and a half pound skin once it's skinned off before I before I flesh it. And I take and flesh it, and after I'm done fleshing it, it weighs less than two pounds. That's an immense amount of fat on a 30 pound animal. That doesn't include everything that's still on the animal and, and inside it. So when you're a yeah. predator and you're that fat, you're really good at what you're doing. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's right. Actually, well, we watch them, we watch them in our own lake here. And it's fascinating to watch them. And, um, you know, they, they put 25,000 trout a year, rainbow trout in this lake, but the otters like the little burbot um, or, or lingcod the best. Really? And they'll go down, they'll, they'll come up with a seven or eight inch lingcod, crunch, crunch, and it's down, go down again, two minutes later up with another one. And it, it entertained us, and it is so entertaining. When, when we go to family out here fishing. So, oh, that's cool. Um, we'll watch them. I, yeah. I don't disagree with them. Ling, Ling are way better eating than trout anyway. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're right. My, my wife says the same thing. <laughs> Do they, let me ask you this Do they eat them all? Like everything, the head and all? Yeah, these are the, the for some reason, and I, I still, I, on some of my lakes, uh, some of my big lakes, I've got um, uh, lingcod that are, are running 25 or 30 pounds. Cool. In this little lake, they I've, I've never caught one, uh, and I catch them ice fishing quite often, more than, oh, 10 or 12 inches long. And the otters bring them up and uh, seven, eight inch lingcod and just eat the whole thing. Oh, that's amazing. Um, that's yeah, yeah, really interesting. But, but I mean, they do it oh, 50 yards from the house here, right out in front on the ice. So, oh, that's cool. Uh, 
I, I, yeah. Like I, I said, mine need a lot of pike, and and if they get a pike, you don't want pike that big. Well, the head will be there, the uh, yeah. pectoral fins, and the and the last bit of the uh, of the tail. That'll be uh, outside mm -hmm. the hole that they're going in and out of. They won't eat that part of it, but they eat everything else. They eat the bones and that. And uh, yeah, everybody talks about how otter eat muskrat or or eat beaver and that, but you know when they have those toilets, it's so easy to to go through like. <laughs> Take your finger and dig around in, in, in stuff and, and, and see what they're eating. And all, all I, I've never found a, a vertebrae bone of, of any size. I've never found hair. Uh, it, no. It's always, I, I find like, because they eat so many of those little tiny, you know, you're talking about those minnows, those uh, um, stickleback minnows are that big and some of them are that big. And so it's almost like, um, you know, little kids wear body glitter. It's almost like body mm -hmm. glitter because of those fine, fine shells. The other thing that we have a lot of is freshwater shrimp in our in, in the bodies of water, and and they they'll take and eat those. And of course, the if they don't crunch that that shell of them, it stays uh, whole, right? But their body digests everything on the inside, so you have all these empty shells of of like ghost shrimp there. You know what I mean? <laughs> really? Oh, it's cool. Oh, I've never. I've never seen that, but I, I have seen where here we have in some of our bigger lakes, we have freshwater mussels. And I've seen them dig those up and you'll get big shell middens where, where they, they open them and eat the, uh, the mussel, the meat, and just left the shells. Yeah. Um, Mike Matney, um, he's the maker of no grip colony cups for, for muskrats. He is from Alaska as well, and at Homer, Homer, Alaska. Anyway, he was talking about about the, the sea otter, and the, you know, one time the sea otter was greatly endangered. Now, yeah. now they're well in excess of fifty thousand, and they don't know what to do with them. And and they talk, they talk about the damage that they do to the shellfish fishery. And he talks mm -hmm. about they can go back through hundreds of years on the middens from the. Uh, the, the First Nations um, villages and that, and they will go right. through, go through the, the layers of these middens and they can find out where there's lots of lots of shellfish and that be, it's, it's part of their diet. And then there'll be no shellfish. And then there'll be lots and then, they, and then there'll be no again. And they, that follows the, the, the cycles of the otter. Of the otters, yeah. Yeah, isn't, isn't that crazy? <laughs> it is, yeah, but, but it's not surprising, I mean, yeah, you look at the link cycle and it's it's so pronounced, right? Yeah. Along yeah. with the hairs uh, here. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I finally see, I, I, I fish, I have a friend on the island, so I go fishing with him once in a while and uh, in the summer, because I, I really like the, the rock cod and the link cod from the ocean. Oh, and yeah. um, I, 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 I've seen my first sea otter um, uh, along the coast of Vancouver Island, um, but he he catches some huge river river otters in in and around the marinas where they steal fish from the fishermen and and, and they can be real pests. But, How big do they get? Um, the biggest skin I've ever seen. Uh, stretched out over ten feet from nose to tail. That, that that's cased, but oh my on God. the board. Yeah, ten yeah, feet. yeah. Really, yeah. you're like four and a half feet or three and a half feet longer than my biggest. And I, I, my heaviest ever was thirty four pounds. That was my heaviest ever riv, river otter. Um, well, we get we get a few that that stretch. Yeah, five feet anyway. But oh, on the island, I I was teaching a, an upgrading course once, and this I, I um that's when we were teaching people how to use that sharp flesher, that necker flesher to, to flesh otters. And this guy says to me, "Well, can you can you demonstrate a, an otter?" Uh, and I said, "Oh, sure, sure." <laughs> so he brought in this. I mean this. Huge <laughs> metal water, <laughs> and and I was determined to look good 
but the sweat was running down my face and I was absolutely exhausted by the time I got the damn thing cleaned. <laughs> and he said, oh, pretty good job. <laughs> Otter are one of those things, right? I mean, they're more work than anything. They're more work than a oh, yeah. fever and everything else. Yeah. And I don't know why for me, but you know, if I put a little tiny nick in a beaver, it doesn't bother me. But if I do it in an otter, it just bothers me forever. And it's always that tail, you know, that the, the tail. Yeah. Once you get down, get that fat off of it, the tail's got a couple little ripples in it. And if you're not careful, you'll you'll put a you'll put a nick in it. And it's like, yeah. you know, there, there's your your sins in, in front of God and everybody right there, you know. <laughs> I don't know why, but I, I like to do a perfect job on otter. <laughs> so do you use um do you use, use an old-fashioned razor with the safety parts broken off for doing the otter tails? Never have, no. Nope. That's a trick that I teach in my classes. And uh, it's another way to make a, a beaver skin absolutely perfect, right? So you, the old three-piece razors, Yes. you just take one and, uh, and break off the safety guards and use a, a regular, you can buy bulk razor blades and uh that really really saves a lot of work on that tail really it does a beautiful beautiful job and you just so, shave it like you were shaving your your face just, yeah but but carefully because you've got no guards there so you're okay. taking the fat off with each stroke but uh you know how hard it is with a oh, fleshing okay. knife to do that <laughs> yeah so when you when you come to the convention, I'll I'll do a demo. Oh yeah, man, I'm I'm in for that. I'm always in for that. Have you ever have you yeah. ever frost scraped the hive? Pardon? Frost scraping. Have no. you have you done frost scraping? Uh no, I've I've seen beavers that were done that way, but <laughs> I, I I I've never tried it. Seems like I mean I my beaver build up all winter and then and then in the springtime when the last thing I do is, is I do my beaver so there's never no frost then right <laughs> you know but uh, right. there's just no time in the in in the in the winter time uh, you know I'm busy taking the hides off them and, and then just roll them up freeze them again and, uh, until the, the springtime and then of course in the spring you can you can have a bunch of beaver drying at once it's it's, it's not a problem but I've watched people right. um, do this frost scraping where they They'll take and set them out overnight on a minus twenty night, and then they uh, use a, a a scraper on them. That and it just does a beautiful job. Looks like it does a beautiful job anyway. I've never. Yeah. Never... Well, the, the instructor group meets uh, usually once a year. I mean, we've had we're, we've been off for a little while now, but as a group, we decided we would teach clean skinning of beavers and that that's what we would teach and if, if people wanted to do it other ways later so that the basic technique we 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 teach is uh is you know with a sharp beaver knife and um but i show them the trick with uh because you know first time students are leaving a, a fair bit of fat and flesh on there so i show them the trick with the the old three-piece razor just to to clean it up nicely. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going uh, to hit the internet it, tomorrow for for an old razor. I know I don't own one. Yeah. I'm going to find out. <laughs> it yeah, doesn't you, fuck up. I mean, you can still you, you can still buy them. They're pretty expensive at, at the the fancy knife places, but um, uh, our our uh, trap dealers out here sell the blades, so that's how popular they are now. No kidding. Uh, there's always something new that's the best part right always something new yeah <laughs> exactly i mean that's why we still do it right because there's always something to learn oh i say it so yeah. many times on the on the show and of course when i'm editing it's like oh i said that again this is like and, and what, what i always say is you know if, if you say you've never never seen something like that before you just haven't been trapped long enough that's all because <laughs> there's always yeah. always something new happening i caught a i caught a muskrat last uh, year in december uh like christmas on a dry land set <laughs> you know <laughs> and yeah a uh, mink ate half of it before i found it you know it was uh i, I went through in the in the dark and, and it was it was a mink set and i went through in the dark the, the night before and it 
nothing had happened. There was nothing going on there. I come by the, the next day uh, in the dark again. I, I went out for a big long check and I came back through. It's one of those little common areas where you cross no matter where, which which one of the loops you're on. And it was looked like somebody had killed a moose there. There was blood on the all over the snow and everything. And there was a there was a big old muskrat and a, and a mink had and managed to eat half of it. <laughs> I always find it fascinating that they'll eat, whether it's from the back end or the front end, but they eat to the bar on the trap and then they quit. It's not like they don't they, they don't yep. go around to the other side and start again. Isn't that strange? That's right. <laughs> yeah, it is. But they you're right, they do that. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've seen that several times. Yeah, I, I have I have a lot of links and and they they quite often shop the squirrels on my my trap line right you know you you'll catch a squirrel in a in a martin box and it hangs down and it takes a big animal to be able to reach them and the lynx but a lynx can't but same thing they will eat up to the bar and mm -hmm. then they won't eat the other side of the bar it's it's, it's so funny yeah. <laughs> so you got yourself a trap line up in the north you've I, I, I've uh, talked with uh, Tim Killian, and, and you have spent an immense amount of time with the BC Trappers Association. You have been everything from president to executive janitor, and <laughs> you are always yeah. there helping out. Tell, tell us about Yeah, I try to be. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, once, once they found out I, I could write, they, they didn't let me get too far away. I was always in some position so that I could write letters for them. And, and I've enjoyed that. I, I made a lot of lifelong friends and, uh, and uh, really loved those conventions. I've hardly missed a convention in all those years. And, uh, and that's been real good. Yeah, known some, unfortunately now, uh, a lot of those old timers are passing away. Uh, yeah. And we've yeah. lost some of them, quite a few of them, but I don't keep going. I even look at the I, people that I that I'd hope to get on a podcast within the last two years that I haven't made it. And it's like these are yeah. these are, are are gems that we are losing, people in, in history that we're losing and and uh, mm -hmm. you know I don't know. I guess I guess when you get to be our age, we start looking at our own mortality, and it, and it always hits us harder about the, the others that that are being lost to the next generation, right? Right, and and that's one of the reasons I wrote the book too. And I, and I, and I got to tell you that the last chapter is called "The End of the Trail," and it, it, I relate the the one rather funny incident that, that that finishes the book nicely, and that is we were. Um, uh, I was, uh, my, my wife and I went to a Ducks Unlimited dinner, a uh, big fundraiser, and um, her friend was with us. And her friend didn't know anything about trapping. And, and so we were, we were talking about trapping and, and life and death and things dying. And I said, well, I said, uh, you know, when, when I go, uh, Karen's going to take me out and, and put me in the bait station and feed me to the coyotes because they deserve to get something back after, <laughs> after all, I've taken so many of them. And the, the local conservation officer was sitting next to us, and we didn't realize he was listening. And he turned to Karen and said, Karen, you know you can't do that. That's, that's just not legal. <laughs> <laughs> and we, of course, we all roared with laughter. It was just, but. Um, <laughs> so, tell uh, me, uh, I, I want to ask you a question here. Uh, probably a couple questions. What is the biggest change that you've seen over years, your years of trapping? Hey, folks, Rich from Trapping Inc. TV here, and it's no secret that I'm a big fan of coffee. Our friends at Old Smokes smoke roast their coffee beans over wood fires. You have no idea how good coffee can taste until it's smoked coffee. Did you know that studies have shown that just the smell of fresh coffee can boost brain activity? Yeah, it's that good. Sandy and I have teamed up with Old Smokes Coffee to make our own Trapping Ink coffee blend. Let me introduce you to Wolverine. 
and ultra dark roast coffee beans smoked over maple wood fires. This is the pure, uncut Trapper's Fuel that keeps us laughing and trapping all day long. If you'd like to try our special blend, you can find it at www.trappinginc.com forward slash shop. If dark roast isn't your thing, Old Smokes has five different coffee roasts from light to extra dark, each roasted over a different wood for a unique flavor. Right now, you can order from their online store and use our promo code RICH, that's R-I-C-H, and get 10% off your entire order. Just go to www.oldsmokescoffee.com. That's O-L-E, smokescoffee.com, and use the promo code RICH. That is promo code RICH for 10% off your entire order. And now let's get back to today's show. Two things. One is the change in equipment. Uh, you know, I, would, I, I was never very comfortable with those old closed jaw number three jump traps and and um and that and i i'm very comfortable now with the the belial foot snares and and um and 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 the 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 little magnums that we use so much yeah um the other thing that isn't so great um is the number of people moving from the cities out into um the semi-rural and rural areas on on the trap lines, and that is proving to be a real problem. Um, you know, they they think they can come out and and dogs can run loose and and um, that we shouldn't be doing what we're doing. Um, so now we have to put up active trap line signs and and we have to deal with these these people. And it's it's quite interesting that um, as long as they don't have any problems, um, they're they can be fairly hostile. Uh, but once um, once they have a skunk in their shed or 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 something killing their chickens or their or their dog, we have a lot of cougars. <laughs> um, but but that's the, that's the other big change is the the number of people now that I have to deal with on a trap line that I thought that was was sort of not full wilderness but semi wilderness. So those are, well, those are the two big changes. When you talk about these people, they, I mean, I understand one thing. I mean, they move they move out to the to the country or the semi rural because it's it's freedom, it's the dream, right? I mean that's everybody's dream, but then they, they then they feel that they, their responsibility has been just totally they're relieved of any responsibility for their own animal. And that and I don't know what to stick there, but here in Alberta, people have to be in control of their animal. And, and if their animal gets in one of my traps that are legally set and everything else, that's their problem. And people get really really upset about that. And I look at them and I say, well, look. You're in downtown Edmonton uh, at the White Mud. You just let your dog go running out across the track. Well, no, that's stupid. I said, well, it's, wait, what we're arguing about right here on my trap line is just as stupid. And it's kind of hard to make them see that because they just feel that they have this, this inalienable freedom to, to not be responsible for their animal. And, you know, and it just doesn't work that way. That's, that's exactly right. And, and the, biggest, the biggest problem is social media. Yeah. Because as soon as something's caught, out comes that camera and all over Facebook and Instagram and everything else are, are photos of uh, uh, their poor pet in, in that kind of situation. Uh, hopefully the same people, it's still alive. Those same people don't even look at a road pancake dog in Vancouver. No. Nope. Not, not even no, once. Right. They didn't even blink. But one animal get caught in one trap and it is, it is yeah. national news. I mean, it, it's yeah. ridiculous yeah. how we do this, you know? Well, I mean, uh, Kelly, uh, uh, President Kelly, you know, was involved in taking out the, the coyotes in Stanley Park that were biting the people. Oh, cool. You know, I mean, uh, it was ridiculous that, you know, close to 40 people had to get bitten yeah. before, and, and some kids badly bitten before they went in there and took out. But to show you the opposite side of it, um, the, the, the uh, 
animal rights people had a vigil for the dead coyotes. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> well, that, but that, that really does show you the dichotomy of, of this society that we're in. Right? You know, the biggest problem in society is today, though, is we're bored. Yeah. We're bored. Yeah. We have time to, be, to worry about such inanities as that. You know? Yeah. People that, people that uh, get a hold of you and say, well, you're gopher trapping. What do you do with the meat? Uh, well, it's a gopher. <laughs> Now I tell them I use it on my bait pile to catch kites. <laughs> that doesn't go over any better than telling them that I left it there. You know what I mean? <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's, it's just the fact that we're bored and we have to, we live in such a wealthy and perhaps decadent society that we can yeah. have the time to enjoy this, to worry about that kind of stuff. It's, it's crazy. What? So... Well, we'll keep we'll keep going and keep trapping while we still can because it's certainly a healthy thing to do. So, now my my other question uh, was, what is the the uh, uh, your favorite improvement, the fa your favorite change in forty years? <laughs> well, that's an interesting one, and I, I I would say unequivocally. Four cycle snowmobiles. Yeah. Amen, <laughs> brother. Amen. <laughs> I I hated those old snowmobiles. They were noisy and it I just and um and when uh when they when they first came out, the new ones, uh I was pretty quick to buy one and and, and now they've improved them to the point where they're really good now. So I, I my very first Four, four stroke snowmobile engine. I actually pulled the lid off of it and shoved a stick down the down the tank because I thought I thought my gas gauge was broken. You know, I was <laughs> I was used to you know you, you, a, a day where you'd put 150, 160 kilometers on, you had to carry carry gas when when you're running a two stroke. And and about hour eight, that that wonderful two stroke headache would set in, you know, and, and from 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 smelling the fumes and all that that, that kind of stuff. But uh, four stroke. I, People say, oh, well, what, what are you going to do when it's 40 below? Well, what do you do with your, your truck? And you know what? Uh, we have started uh, snowmobiles at, at, uh, at 40 below, and, and the only one that didn't start was the two strokes. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I have quite a few moose on the line, and, uh, and, and, and that machine is so quiet now that I call them my pets. It's, they they just those those old cow old cow moves just stand there and look at me when I come by and I kind of wave at them and three days later I'll come by again and wait for them but uh, yeah no that that's been a, a really great thing. Your number one favorite animal to trap? Uh, without a doubt, lynx. Yeah, why is that? Uh, well, because I was involved in that. Uh, uh, I coordinated the uh, transplant into Colorado. So um, I, uh, when we reintroduced them down there in the, and uh, so we live trapped and kept lynx in holding pens for several years and, and then trucked them down there. So we got, uh, you know, I don't want to brag, but I, I, I probably know more about lynx trapping than, than just about anybody in the province. Um, and especially how to trap them without doing any any injuries whatsoever. And, and uh, I mean, my my wife got so competent uh, and so familiar, she would actually get inside the holding pens with most of them, and uh, she knew which ones had certain personalities, and, oh, really? and she got amazing oh. photos. Uh, um, cool. You know, up up close and personal. So, um, so you know, at the same time, into, into into live traps, then? Pardon? You're getting them going to live traps into live cages? Yeah, we yeah we developed um, our, some of the local trappers right here. Uh, developed 
uh, a drop door live trap that worked really well. And it, it was it was so successful that uh, we would catch the same links over and over and have to let it out, you know, that, you know, they wanted uh, female, adult females. So if there was kittens or anything, we just opened the door and let them out. Well, five, you know, a couple of days later, they'd, they'd be back in there for another free meal. <laughs> um, we, we caught a couple of cougars in those same live traps. Oh, wow. And, and how they, how they ever got, well, because they were so cramped in there, uh, they didn't destroy the trap, and and we actually managed to let them out. Um, I caught a big male fisher one day though, and he he ate the two by two frame of the inside of the trap, and then chewed chewed, chewed right through the wire and got out. So. <laughs> yeah, they're a whole different kind of ugly. They are. Yeah. So I get lots of questions. You know, people talk to me. Well, you know, we got one. We, we get to, to, to trap one lynx uh, or one bobcat, but we're only allowed to use uh, live traps. What is what's the secret to get them going into a live trap? Canada goose carcass. A <laughs> goose carcass. Is that yeah. a fact? Yeah, we legally in British Columbia we we have to uh, remove the edible meat. But when we were live trapping them without a, it was absolutely no question. And they would get in those live traps and they would destroy that, what was left of that goose carcass. They would eat every last bit of it. And um, it, it's a strange thing because in the wild, you know, a lynx, how often would a lynx get a chance to, to, to kill or eat a, a Canada goose? But you want to catch a lot of key, a lot of links. <laughs> it's funny because now that you mention this, um, there's one place where we have to build a bridge over and over and over and over again. It seems like I don't know, maybe three times that we build a bridge there. You go there in June, and there's been several times we have found goose wings there on this on this creek. We found goose wings, and we've, mm -hmm. we've found. Uh, uh, you know, like both carcasses will be there, like four wings. So the, it was obviously mm -hmm. a, a pair defending the, the nest knot. I always thought it was maybe coyote, but maybe, maybe now it's, you're making me think it's lynx. Could be, but but there's absolutely no question. There's something about the smell and the fat that, uh, well, just try it. The next time you're lynx trapping, uh, see if you can get a hold of a, a carcass and hang it there and you'll be, a, a, it, They'll they'll do anything to get at that lynx carcass, oh, that that it's goose amazing. carcass. Yeah, that's yeah. Amazing. One of those things. Okay, then tell me what animal made the biggest fool out of you? Makes the biggest what? Sorry? What animal made the biggest fool out of you? Um, I still think coyotes. Like everybody tells me, you know, what's this hardest animal to trap? And I say, an old bitch coyote that's raised two or three litters is is almost uncatchable. <laughs> I think coyote are tougher. Coyote in the big bush are tougher than than wolves, because the wolves. Oh, absolutely, the no question. Got that no that question. distraction of the pack going on all the time, you know. And, yeah, and that's because right. they're they're constantly bickering and pushing one another, like they're yeah. they're like like those great eight teenage yeah. boys that you 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 were used to teach, you know, they're pushing yeah. one another, and then somebody ends up in a trap or a snare, and then the whole world blows up. Well, then you, then you get a bunch of them. But you take a coyote in the big bush, and that coyote's all by itself usually, unless it's an old uh, an old female, like mm -hmm. you say. Yeah. And uh, even so, they are they are their whole world is danger. They're 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 constantly worried about. About a wolf getting uh, getting a hold of them, they, mm -hmm. they hate the smell of of steel yeah. and all that. Where I do my coyotes here and on, on the on the home ranch here, um, you know, there's there's barbed wire fence everywhere. A coyote probably crawls under a dozen barbed wire fences before noon every day. So the smell of steel doesn't bother them, but the smell of steel is a whole different thing up in the big bush. And I I yeah. agree that the toughest thing to go mono or yeah. mono with. I catch more wolves on, on my wolf baits every year than I do coyotes. And there's lots of coyotes, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, no, I gotta agree with you there. Um, and every once in a while, I get a, boot, a beaver 
the big old beaver that makes a fool of me too. And, and I got one right now. I, did, uh, I, I, I caught the 60 pound male and I think that old female was, was watching because boy, she won't come near a conifer now. <laughs> yeah. So what do you go to then? A foothold or, or you're you're gonna well you, you yeah start, sometimes but but I, I I found that they uh they never get real smart with under ice snares. So I usually wait until the ice is thick enough and then set under ice snares and and, and that think, seems to get the smartest ones. Yeah. I, I think my biggest my biggest mano a mano battle was with the beaver. And it went on for it went on through uh, a spring, a fall, and the next spring I finally ended up getting it. <laughs> Same thing though, you'd show up and set a trap and it would leave the house. And you think yep. I could figure out where its bank dam was, but it would be gone. Yep. I would catch, I would catch the female and I would catch the kids and all that. I could never catch that old male. I finally got him yep. on a um, it was under the ice, and I got him on a a, a baited uh, hanging conibear, bear, and I had it perpendicular mm -hmm. to the dam. And so he had some, I don't, you know, lots of times they have a uh a bank den on, on the far end of the, the dam, right? You know, they'll, they'll swim mm -hmm. out and, and they'll check the dam and then they'll go crawl in there for a day or two. I don't know, man cave, get away from the old lady, whatever. <laughs> you know, yeah, well, we, call, we call them spook holes. Spook holes, okay. I, I, learned, I learned about them from otters because the first place an otter goes is he, he trucks along the dam and he can't get under the ice anywhere there. Then he goes to the end of the dam and they start digging through the snow and then pretty soon they're under and they go. But I caught this this one by by putting a you know a popper bait stick on a on a, a three thirty hanging hanging down and it had it perpendicular to the dam just out I don't know a couple feet out, out out clear of it and and he went swimming on by and he seen it I guess couldn't resist it he did it was something new but it took me it took me over a year to get that that single beaver <laughs> yeah I've been there done that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we have chatted here away for, for, for well over an hour. Yep. Tell okay. us again the name of your book, Paul. Okay, The Mad Trapper from Greeny Lake. Okay, and how are people going to get a hold of you? Uh, my email is the best. So pblackwell63 at hotmail.com. Perfect. Perfect. And uh, I... I Send copies all across the country, so it's it's a very easy thing to do now. Absolutely, I have so enjoyed talking with you tonight, and I uh, can't wait to, uh, to 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 spend some more time. I'd I'd love to come see your lake and and, and go do some trapping. Um, this is uh, has has been uh, fun. It, it is great to to talk to somebody who has uh, your depth of of uh, time and experience out there, you know, and I I, I like how. I, I ask you a question about what's changed, and you come out on on the uh, on the people who who have moved out into the bush and the problem the problems they're causing. That people just don't see that, you know. But the the you know I I'm always people always say, well, you're the crusty old guy yelling at the kids to stay off the lawn kind of thing, right? I, I say you don't understand what's going on here, you know. But I I mean uh, it's it's neat to 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 see somebody else uh, that, that's a kindred spirit that understands the probably the biggest threat to to trapping, hunting, and fishing. It's, right. it's those people moving out, you know? Well, when you can buy it, when you can sell a house for a million two or a million five in Vancouver and buy one up here for 300,000 and and you've got, you know, seven, 800,000 to retire on, it's very tempting. And that's the problem still. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Anyway, it has been a anyway. pleasure. I want everybody out there to, uh, Make sure to check out Paul's book. I'm, I'll uh, I'll uh, deal with you here afterwards, Paul. I'm, I want to get a couple of copies of it, and uh, I'm just going to say thank you for your time. Thank you. It's All been right. a pleasure too. And I want to thank everybody out there for for joining us. This will be up in a couple of days. It has been a blast, and uh, maybe we'll see you down the line.